All right, thank you. You already took 10 seconds up, Marla, with that introduction, so you've seen that slide. Again, I want to try to make this clinically relevant and, and practical. So we're going to talk about biosimilars. Certainly, they're, they're, they're entering practice at a rapid pace. We're going to understand, try to understand what it is, learn how they compare to originator biologics, know the data for them, how they were approved, what's the data in IBD specifically, and how to talk to your patients about this to make them uh, comfortable about it. So the scenarios you're likely to see, it's potentially a new start, uh, or if you're in, an insurance or ACO switches to a biosimilar, and that's typically going to be, hopefully, when switching a stable patient. Case scenario, 24-year-old, five-year-old male with a three-year history of ileocolonic Crohn's disease, has his second flare requiring steroids in the last year. You plan to infl initiate infliximab. Infliximab DYYB is approved by his insurance company, and the patient asks you, well, what is this? And if this has similar efficacy and safety in IBD as the brand name or innovator product. He doesn't use the word innovator. I put that in for you guys. So what is a biosimilar? It is a biologic product that is highly similar to a previously approved reference or originator or innovator product notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components, right? That's the definition. There are no clinically meaningful differences in terms of safety, purity, or potency. They are not generics, right? Generics are small molecules, and they are actually identical to the reference product. Biologic drugs, they're larger, they're complex, they have tertiary and quaternary folding, they're, they're impossible to make identical, hence the term biosimilar, and we're not using the term generic. Why biosimilars? Really came about in hopes of decreasing cost and, and improving access. It came from the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the Affordable Care Act, and again, depending on which side of the aisle, some people refer to it as Obamacare. Uh, it, these reforms included the introduction of an abbreviated licensure pathway for these biosimilars so they can be approved uh, at a much less expensive way than it takes to develop a new biosimilar and again to hope to uh, provide affordable access. They're ten uh, intended and depending on where you are typically outside the U.S. there have been clear-cut decreased costs. Um, how it's affected patient access or patient costs is still, I think, a bit unclear. So the requirements are much less stringent, and again, it was based on the uh, Affordable Care Act, and, and it really relies on sort of preclinical, in the lab, analytical similarity with the originator product. There's much less reliance on, on really clinical uh, uh, studies. It, it really needs to show the same structure, function, immunogenicity, animal toxicity, pharmacokinetics, and, and PD as the originator. And then they do need to do a couple of studies in humans and need to show comparable clinical safety and efficacy. Again, the vast majority of these non-clinical studies showing that it's, it's, it's similar as far as what we really care about is in Humans, they need to do one uh, study where PK is the primary endpoint and another one where they do a comparative effectiveness study demonstrating non-inferiority uh, in human subjects. Other definitions to be aware of, extrapolation really means that data in one disease state, in this case I'm going to show you data on ANC spawn and RA, can be used for approval for all disease states that have been previously licensed for the reference product, in this case that includes adult IBD. Interchangeability is different. That means you can exchange biosimilars with originators and vice versa with no greater risk of adverse events or decreased efficacy, and it needs to be shown that there can be multiple switches. Currently, no drugs are approved as interchangeable. If that were the case, substitution could be done by pharmacies without 
MD notification, and that's called an automatic substitution, and that's based on state laws. So again, I showed you this slide. There are six biosimilars approved for adult IBD. The two you're probably seeing most are at the bottom, Renflexus and Inflector, and I'll use the more branded names because the other ones are nearly impossible to remember. What was it approved on? It, like I said, it was based on studies in, in the rheumatologic diseases. This is the phase one. This is 250 patients with active ankylosing spondylitis. And again, the primary endpoint here was PK, the area under the curve and the uh, max concentration between weeks 22 and 30. There were a bunch of secondary endpoints that really are what we care about, much more clinical uh, efficacy and safety. And you can see here, or maybe you can't, there's actually two curves but they're that close together that they're basically overlapping, really showing no difference between uh, innovator and biosimilar. This is more data from there, some of the secondary endpoints, and again, I'm not going to go into the details. This is their version of the CDAI or the Mayo Index. You can basically see that efficacy outcomes at uh, week 30, adverse events, and risk of anti-drug antibodies are the same between the groups, and this went up through week 30. This is the big phase three trial here. It was, again, 606 now RA patients, still active despite methotrexate. They were randomized to innovator or the biosimilar, in this case, CTP13. Again, lower dose than we use, and again, here the primary endpoint was their version of the drop in CDAI of, of 70 points. You can see here, no difference, a stricter endpoint, the ACR15, no difference, adverse events, anti-drug antibodies, all similar, shown to be non-inferior in this patient population. Both studies met their primary endpoint, hence approval in uh, RA and ANXPON, as well as extrapolation to IBD, psoriasis, uh, anything else that had already had approval, right? But, you know, you want to know, well, what about IBD? For, this is for a new start. This is one study, double-blind, randomized controlled uh, trial to assess the non-inferiority of CTP13 compared to uh, Innovator and Fliximab, randomized one-to-one. -one. These are bio-naive, symptomatic, moderate to severe Crohn's disease, standard induction, uh, anybody responding at week 14 continued into the maintenance. Uh, and you can see here the early endpoints, CDI 70, CDI drop in 100 and clinical remission. Same, same, same at week 6. Same, same, same at week 30. No endoscopic scores, but no difference in CRP, fecal calprotectin at the different endpoints, no difference in adverse events, and no difference, for me importantly, in drug concentrations or antibodies. And I'll show you at week 30, some of the patients switched and some stayed, and I'll show you that data in a little bit. This is a big uh, study that was uh, published. It was about 5,000 naive patients to uh, infliximab, and they were either given uh, infliximab or the biosimilar, and again, they didn't have patient-specific data, but you can see the primary outcome, which was death, crone surgery, all-cause hospitalization, or need to re require another biologic, was the same whether it was the biosimilar or the branded, and again, it basically all looks the same, and if I showed you the safety slide, which I don't have time for, that also looked the same. Importantly, Drug concentrations between the biosimilar and the biologic innovator are the same. So you can use that same assay whether you're checking for the biologic innovator or whether you're checking for the biosimilar. Case two, which you might actually be seeing more, is not a new start but a switch. 29-year-old, extensive UC, previously steroid dependent, in deep remission on infliximab, five mg per kg every seven weeks, her infliximab concentration is adequate at 7.5. You can see her colon is beautiful looking. She changes jobs. She told her new insurance wants her to switch. She has to switch to uh, one of the biosimilars. And she asked if switching to a biosimilar is safe. You have to be able to answer that question. 
So this is really a non, talking about non-medical switching, switching of an agent amongst patients with well-tolerated adequate response to therapy, and this can be from bio, uh, biosimilar to innovator, innovator to biosimilar, or one drug class to another drug class. It really doesn't matter. We talked about interchangeability, which is that it's, that's a, a law, and it basically would state that the drug can legally be substituted at the pharmacist level, and if that were the case, they could do it without your uh, knowledge or approval. And again, no biosimilars to date are designated as interchangeable. They would need to show studies that show multiple switches back and forth are safe. Currently, there's no data for that in IBD. There are two studies uh, in RA that show that multiple switches does appear to be safe. This is the big study. This is the one that came out. It's, it's the NOR switch. We're up in Norway. They basically switched all their patients from branded infliximab to CTP-13. And what the primary endpoint here was, they were looking at non-inferiority. It was a pretty wide margin of 15%. Um, and it was basically, they called it disease worsening. And it depended on what disease, how they defined it. But you can see here that based on this, and those are the sort of subcomponents of the different patient populations, none of them were worse when switched from uh, drug to biosimilar. So it was able, so they basically, a one-time switch appeared to be safe. There were no changes in trough levels and antibodies, disease scores, um, and it was empowered to, to look at a difference between the subtypes. So one trial, what about specifically in IBD? This is one, there have been a couple. This was a prospective study of almost 180 patients with Crohn's, most, most of them Crohn's switched to a biosimilar and they found that the same percentage of patients at baseline in remission were the same after the switch as well, similar drug concentrations and similar antibodies. So this is that uh, large trial of about 200 patients. And again, I showed you the original data where starting a new patient on a biosimilar or a innovator biologic was, was no different, equally safe and equally effective here. Some of the patients had a single switch from branded to biosimilar, and some had a switch from biosimilar to branded, and two other groups sort of continued what drug they were on. And here you can see that it really didn't matter whether you stayed on drug or switched, and whether you switched from one to the other. Same uh, percentage of patients in remission after this switch. So again, bringing it into Practice switching may be a reasonable option if it's cost effective and patient agreeable, but based on current data, this is best when the patient is in stable, a sustained remission and stable dosing. There's less data on PK immunogenicity and efficacy if you're switching someone who has active disease. There's just less data. Um, beware of the nocebo effect which is basically the sort of evil brother of the placebo effect, right? If a patient is switching and they're like, they don't really want to do it and they're nervous about it, they're more likely to have a, a perceived adverse event from the drug or perceived loss of response. So again, if you're doing this, you have to have a conversation. You have to be comfortable explaining that a one-time switch is fine or starting you on this appears to be fine based on all the data that we have. Again, in IBD, there's no data on multiple switches going from branded to biosimilar, back to branded to a different biosimilar, however you want to do it. No data in IBD. Again, two studies uh, in, I think, psoriasis uh, suggesting it may be uh, safe. So who would you not want to switch if you had the option of not doing it, sort of these vulnerable populations, you know, someone who's pregnant, pediatric patients, someone with active disease, particularly if they're not doing well and is likely to require surgery or has an, another negative outcome. 
um, or someone where you're just in induction, they're not on a stable regimen, you haven't really optimized them based on proactive TDM, which you're all doing now. Um, me personally, like I said, I would check infliximab concentrations before a switch and then follow them up after the switch. And again, most data suggests it shouldn't really change. So in conclusion, biosimilars, they're by definition are highly similar to an originator or innovator, biologic. They are not generics, again, uh, designed to hopefully decrease costs and increase access for patients. They're now available, I'm sure, well, let's ask because I have the time. How many people have used biosimilars? Yeah, so, well, it's good, actually. Less than have used proactive TDM, so I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but I think these are, are going to become more and more common, uh, and I, I think we're going to start seeing more and more of these. Again, how were they approved? They were really approved based on mostly non-clinical studies, but the two clinical studies based, the approval was in ANXPON for the PK and RA for the non-inferiority study. There have been, and I just showed you some of them, there have been other observational studies and controlled studies in IBD specifically that demonstrate efficacy and safety similar to the originator for new starts. Also data, and again, I didn't show all of it, that a one-time switch to a biosimilar is uh, safe. None of these are interchangeable. An assessment of anti-drug antibodies and drug concentrations can be used uh, with brand or with in, uh, biosimilar. Some practical points. If you have clinically significant antibodies to branded or originator infliximab, you cannot switch to the biosimilar, they are cross-reactive. Again, think of it as a similar agent. If you have a primary non-response with good antibody, uh, sorry, with good drug concentrations, you should not switch to the biosimilar. If you have an infliximab holiday for whatever reason and a history of prior response, you could use the biosimilar in a rechallenge. Again, I caution you after you do that first reinduction dose, prior to that second one, you should check drug concentrations and antibodies. If there are antibodies present already, that's the patient that will likely have a severe reaction at that second infusion. The second infusion of the second time you're on infliximab is the highest risk for a severe infusion reaction. Combination therapy with the thiopurine or methotrexate is still recommended in the right clinical context, but I would strongly consider the use of proactive TDM. A one-time switch appears to be safe, but it's, most of the data is in patients on a stable dose in uh, clinical remission. I wouldn't particularly do this if it were my choice in patient who's pregnant, pediatrics, active ongoing disease, or where you haven't gotten a stable dosing regimen. And again, I check antibodies and drug concentrations before and after a switch.